All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sierra Lau, and I would like to welcome you to our How to Use Naloxone, a training for school-based health center providers webinar. Um, this is a final webinar in a four-part series on youth and substance use prevention. Uh, we'd like to take a moment to thank our funders, Cal the California Youth Opioid Response for supporting this project. A few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be posted on our website and emailed to you after the presentation. And we're gonna be answering questions throughout the presentation. So if you have any questions come up during the presentation, please go ahead and type them in the chat. Just a little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance before we get started. Uh, we are a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. We do this through two main ways. One is advocating for more school-based health centers and the other is supporting and improving the existing school-based health centers. Uh, we do this through policy, capacity building, technical assistance, like today's webinar. And then there's a link at the bottom there where you will also be able to find the recording and slides as well as additional resources for this presentation afterwards. Just to take a quick moment to talk about our conference, our 2023 conference. Can't believe it's coming up. Um, it will be on Monday, April 17th, will be the actual conference. And then we will be having Advocacy Day on Tuesday, April 18th. It will be in Sacramento this year. I guess it's next year, but it feels like this year, um, this school year. We hope to see you there and we will be reaching out to you all to let you know about upcoming registration details. And just to take a moment uh, to talk about our membership. If you are not already a member, it's a great time to join before conference. That way you can get the registration discount. Uh, we also provide technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. And then there's a link to go ahead and sign up if you're, if you're interested. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to our two speakers today. We have Charles Hawthorne from California Bridge and Karen Gersten Rothenberg from La Clinica de la Rosa. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and I pass it over to Charles. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be on with you today. Um, my name is Charles Hawthorne. I am the Equity and Harm Reduction Project Manager at California Bridge, um, and I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about overdose prevention and naloxone distribution. Um, so I guess just to start out a little bit about my background, um, I have come from a harm reduction background. I've worked with syringe access programs and harm reduction programs um, and in the Bay and across California for about four or five years now. Um, currently, I'm at California Bridge, where we are supporting uh, hospitals across the state and starting their syringe, starting um, uh, substance use treatment programs and naloxone distribution programs in their emergency departments, uh, which has been super cool. I've been working actually with a lot of the children's hospitals who have been coming on board. Um, I really love doing youth work. That's actually where I kind of started in this area. So I'm always really happy to be able to talk to folks who do youth work and, and how I can best support them and uh, kind of advancing um, what they do. Um, so this is going to be a bit of a general overdose prevention and naloxone distribution training. So if you have any questions that come up, please feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, I'm pretty good at going back and forth between the chat and talking, so please don't feel uh, like that will be too rough for me. Um, and yeah, and I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to just go ahead and hear from y'all as you're coming through. Um, okay, so cool. So let's just go ahead and get started. Um, so just a little background on California Bridge. We're a program of the Public Health Institute, um, and we uh, just kind of work with them very closely and in, in being able to support programs across the state in, uh, in doing this work. Um, and the goal of our work is to make sure that there's access to high quality treatment um, in hospitals across the state by 2025. So we are uh, basically trying to make sure there's access to treatment 24 seven in hospitals across the state, um, which really starts to close the gap in terms of access to care. Um, and we've started really start working more in this round um, of funding. We currently have a, a funding uh, opportunity open called our Bridge Navigator Program, which is funding hospitals to uh, get uh, substance use navigators. So we're actually right now working on getting some substance use navigators placed at a few of the children's hospitals across the state, as I mentioned. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in learning more about that, or if you have a connection to a hospital that doesn't currently have a bridge program or a substance use treatment program in it, um, please reach out to me afterwards. I'd be love to connect with you. All right. So as we know about substance use over the past few years, overdose deaths have been really rapidly rising. Um, and 
uh, it kind of is coming out in a few different ways. So this is a chart from uh, the CDC basically talking about um, how we are, how uh, overdoses have begun to rise in a few different areas. So spe specifically that any overdose category, um, we're seeing that heroin and semi-synthetic uh, opioids have had like a boost, but these other synthetic opioids, specifically fentanyl, have been taking a lot of the bulk of the reason that overdose deaths have been going up. And I'll talk a little bit more about why uh, in my presentation as we move forward. But specifically, we know with youth, there has been a significant increase as well. So if you look at this chart, this top line that you see right here um, is all overdose deaths that have been occurring. So I think this chart is accurate up to 2019. There's been a bit of lag of data due to COVID. So we haven't really been able to get a lot past since then. But for ages 15 to 24, like overdose death rates are really, really high. Um, and they started to turn down a little bit. And I'm not really sure what the data will say, but I'm assuming that it'll say that these this, this downturn probably is evened out a bit um, due to COVID. Um, and a lot of those are due to opioid deaths. Um, and even though that we're seeing like heroin deaths go down, um, it's often because heroin is like much less of the drug supply at this point, and it's really, fentanyl is really starting to take off. And so this is something really to be concerned about and to be talking about. Um, and even in my experience here in Oakland, I do know of young people, people who are under the age of 18, people who are under the age of 14 even, who have come into contact with fentanyl, either intentionally or unintentionally, um, young people who are using and, and smoking fentanyl with their friends, people who, uh, young people who have uh, come in contact with other opioids, such as illicit pills and things like that. Um, and so this is just a... Uh, <clears throat> really serious thing to kind of be considering and thinking about, which is why I'm also really happy to be here because the people who are on this call, y'all are the ones who are really able to create an opportunity to interrupt and educate about this in order to make sure that we're saving young people and um, helping giving them, helping to give them the tools to stay safe, um, even if they are beginning to like trapeze into substance use or experiment with drugs. So just to start out, um, the first question I usually kind of point out when I am doing these presentations is what comes to mind when you think of harm reduction? Um, I think uh, that they, we were just able to edit the chat so everyone should be able to chat right now. And I'd love if a few people could just come into the chat and just name, like what are some things that come to mind when you first hear the term harm reduction, when you think about harm reduction in relationship to your work and in relationship to working with youth, what are some of the things that come to mind for you? Meeting people where they're at. Yes, thank you, Jesus. So yeah, so uh, we're understanding that people have a specific place where they are existing, like what they are ready for, what they're ready to talk about, what they're ready to change and what they're not ready to change and really connecting with people and meeting them where they're at as opposed to saying, you need to be doing this before I even working, work, start working with you. Um, Arlinda added stay safe, Francisco added education um, and Leah added education as well around drug knowledge. Um, maybe uh, Kaylin added reducing frequency of use, acknowledging use happens. That's the really big one with youth, acknowledging that drug use happens. Maybe reducing the intensity or frequency. Uh, thank you, Jet. And then Michael added non judgmental, non shaming. So we're trying to come from a place of education and support, not judgment and shame. That's a really big um, framework difference in the way that we maybe talk about drugs under a harm reduction framework as opposed to in the past. Um, also, uh, fentanyl test strips. So maybe some specific t uh, tools that we can give people to help better understand what is going on with their drug supply. You know, when we operate in an illicit drug supply, you don't always know what you're getting. And so giving people tools to figure that out is absolutely harm reduction. Um, maybe uh, understand, like uh, Leah added this contemplation or pre-contemplation piece. So if you've ever worked with the stages of change or the trans theoretical model of change, thinking about what it takes for people to change their relationship to all types of behaviors, but specifically substance use, and thinking about sometimes people are in a place where they are not even thinking about it, or they're thinking about it, but they're not quite ready to make a change and being able to could still connect with them and still have conversations with them is absolutely what it looks like to move from a harm reduction place. And then Ali added uh, reducing harms because drug use will happen, give youth the tools to reduce harm, make party safe plans, access to naloxone, absolutely. Y'all are right on top. 
perfect. This is all super great. So that means I can kind of speed through these next sessions because this, this is exactly what we're kind of talking about. So in general, the harm reduction approach is talking about how do we utilize a spectrum of strategies to reduce the negative consequences associated with drug use, sex work, and other behaviors. I usually include sex work in here because that's actually how I got my harm reduction start was at a program in Washington, DC um, that primarily served uh, at that point, black trans sex workers um, who also use drugs. And so um, I, I, and the harm reduction movement was really created in conjunction with both people who use drugs and people who did sex work. And so it feels important for me to include it in this um, whenever I start talking about it. Um, and a lot of these same uh, skills apply. But if you want to talk a little bit more about sex work or, or sex or harm reduction around that, I am absolutely available to have that conversation as well at another time. Um, but essentially, these things that you're naming are exactly it. So we have these few categories. So we have something like safer techniques. So that might be things like those fentanyl test strips, having naloxone, those tools. And even if you are using drugs, even if you don't even change the way that you use them, you can be safer by having some knowledge and some tools about how to navigate that. So for example, um, when we talk about uh, for uh, drinking, a safer technique for drinking might be, okay, even if you're gonna go and you're gonna have like five or six drinks tonight, make sure you eat a full meal, make sure you drink some water throughout the night. And that's gonna reduce the risks that you have from that drinking even if you drink the same amount, if you're getting some adequate nutrition and you're staying hydrated, that's a safer technique. We also have managed use. So a few people kind of named this up here of reducing intensity of use, reducing frequency of use. So understanding that every time you use doesn't mean you have to just go wild. Sometimes you can use a little bit. I know people who smoke a little bit of fentanyl, who smoke a little bit of heroin. I know people who make the choice that they're gonna drink once a month or only at weddings. People are able to manage their drug use in all different types of ways, but a lot of that comes down to how are they empowered and given the tools to be able to do that. Um, and so we want to be able to hold that. And, the, and I think that that's exactly where that non-judgmental and non-shaming comes in, is letting people be able to make decisions that work for them and not superimpose our own ideas around what their drug use is supposed to look like on them. And that gets especially complicated when we start working with young people, especially young people who we feel responsible for or beholden to. Um, but I think a lot of the times when I've started doing this work, how, how I've had to kind of maintain my perspective around youth work is understanding that young people have sovereignty, they have power, they have choice just as much as the rest of us. And uh, we don't actually support them by, by circumnavigating that. We support them by uh, really helping them see where their power lies and helping them make choices that work for them, which is right in line with this last piece around abstinence. So me, I have another question that I wanted to kind of pose, which is, you know, a lot of the times when I talk about harm reduction, um, one of the things that uh, one of the things that uh, comes up is people kind of say something like, "Well, you're either for uh, harm reduction or you're for abstinence. You can't be for both." But, you know, I put abstinence on my slide to the harm reduction approach. So when you see that, how do you see abstinence fitting into the spectrum? What does it mean to be abstinent from a harm reduction perspective? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? How do you think about abstinence when it comes to working with youth? Of course. So we have abstaining from one substance. That's my favorite one. So sometimes you might be like, you know what? Me and alcohol, we are not friends anymore. I have, we have hung out. We, we've had some great times. But you know what? That doesn't work for me. I actually don't want to use alcohol anymore. I don't want to drink. But my relationship with cannabis is just fine. Whether that's because I'm not ready to deal with it, whether that's because it actually works really well for me, whether it's because I am able to uh, navigate whatever harms come from that more easily, but whatever point, I don't have to be absent from everything in order to address this relationship that I have that isn't serving me or is maybe causing some really negative side effects. And then maybe also choosing abstinence at certain times of days. Exactly. So for example, if I had decided before I hopped on this call that I was going to take shit, six shots of tequila, um, I probably would not be doing a good job right now. 
I would be forgetting what slide came next. I wouldn't really know um, how to how to talk around some of these complicated subjects. Um, I'd really have a lot of trouble reading all of your names. Um, and so how I might regulate my uh, substance use is by restricting my alcohol use to the evenings or to the weekends when I'm able to do that and still maintain doing my job at the same time. Um, exactly, and it's a tool within harm reduction, exactly. It, it, uh, when you are making choices that work for you, it's nice to have everything on the table. And sometimes having the option of not using it all is actually really reassuring and supportive for people in creating their plan. Um, and then also uh, having a backup safety plan in case the abstinent plans doesn't hold up. So there's also a reality piece of it and understanding that, you know, abstinence is, a, people have complicated relationships to drugs. And sometimes you people wake up one day and they're like, you know what, I'm done, I'm not using ever again. And who knows what happens six months later, six weeks later, six days later. And I think that sometimes when we operate from an abstinence only perspective, it, it boxes people in. It doesn't have any alternatives. It doesn't give you a lot of support in the case that you do choose to go back to using or go back to using like in whatever emotional state that might put you in. But from a harm reduction perspective, we understand that that's human and we want to support you and we want to give you the idea of like, okay, yes, absolutely. If, if absence is what you want right now, please do that. And if that changes, let's talk about some ways to keep you safe and let's give you some tools so that if you do return to use, you can stay safe. And that is especially relevant when we start talking about overdose. Um, and then last comment over here, clients might give their body a break to abstain for one week and see how that goes. But I never really use the word absence with clients. It usually stopping, giving the body a break, taking a pause. I love that. And I especially love that in like how you, we do youth work, because sometimes we can use these big adult words that feel permanent, and I think what's nice is giving youth the opportunity to play with what they have choice with in that moment and understand that like things shift for them all the time in their realities all the time. And some sometimes taking small bites of things of saying, this is not about saying you will never use us again. This is about saying right now, what you say, what I'm hearing from you is your body needs a break. And I think that is a perfectly reasonable thing to do is to take a break. And then you can reassess how you feel after that. And if you want to keep going, you can keep going. If you want to talk about it again, then maybe go back to youth. We can talk, go back to use. Maybe we can talk about it again and talk about keeping you safe. Um, and I, I really love that. I'm really loving what y'all are having to say here. So um, just one thing that I kind of wanted to bring a point up on is this, ooh, this difference between, uh, ooh, my slides are not working. There we go a harm reduction versus emergency response. So when we talk about harm reduction is we are talking about redistributing power and resources. We are talking about giving people power, giving people sovereignty, making, letting them make choices to do what they need to do in the face of our world. And I know especially like the people in this call are super aware of this, of how youth are really disenfranchised, about what it means to be a young person of color, what it means to be a young poor person, what does it mean to be a young person who is the, either an immigrant themselves or a child of immigrants, of all these things that can really impact your choice and limit your choices and make it hard for you to face structural violence. And, and um, sometimes drug use is a direct response to that. And so harm reduction in congruence with that is about okay, even though your drug use might stem from dealing with the structural violence, we can also give you these tools to make sure that you can keep yourself as safe as possible. So when we start talking about Narcan, harm reduction is putting it in the hands for people for free, low barrier uh, access, making sure that people have the knowledge and the resources to be able to use it. As opposed to the emergency response side of things, is there is somebody overdosing in front of you and you need to have an emergency response to make sure that they live, which, is, which isn't necessarily harm reduction, but that's, and maybe it's a bit of a trite point, but I think that what I like to kind of drive home here is just kind of thinking about, this isn't necessarily just emergency response work. This is also about how are you materially giving people the tools and resources to keep themselves and their community safe, even in the event that you might not be in the room at that point. Um, cool. 
So what is an overdose? When we talk about overdose, sometimes it can be like this big, huge, scary word, and it can be kind of hard to dig into what it really means. So an overdose, the way I define it is any time that a drug overwhelms your ability, your body's ability to cope with it. So for example, um, have, has anybody here ever, you've, you came into the office one day or you sat down at your desk one day and you were like, I have so much work to get done. I need to get through a hundred emails. I need to write a report. I need to do a presentation. I need to put all these things together. I need to get back all these projects, all these things. So I'm going to guzzle like two double shot espresso um, lattes. Um, and then you sit down at your desk and you just end up reorganizing all of your folders um, for like four hours and you're just jittery and just standing up to use the bathroom. And then next thing you know, it's like three o'clock and you haven't gotten anything done. Um, that's a caffeine overdose. <laughs> your ca that caffeine overwhelmed your body's ability to cope with it. And of course, overdoses all happen on a spectrum. And so it's never just like you're alive or you're dead. It's always different drugs have different effects on the body. And some of those effects can be more deadly than others. So what puts people at risk for overdoses? Um, lots of things. So number one, mixing drugs is a big thing. So when you're having multiple drugs work on multiple systems in your body, it's more likely to overwhelm it. Um, variations in drug supply. So you know when you go and get medication from the pharmacy, if it's 100 milligrams, it's 100 milligrams. It's tested, you're sure, you're able to make an informed decision about that. As opposed to when you are buying things on the street, it's not always the same. Even if you are getting 100% pure heroin, you don't actually know how strong that heroin is. And there can be really big variations even within heroin. And then when you start talking about fit and all those get even bigger. Um, and so those variations in the drug supplies can be really hard. Um, new and experimental use. So, you know, prior to fit and all kind of entering um, into the drug supply in the way that it has over the past 15 or so years, um, the biggest uh, risk that factor for overdose was people either being brand new users or returning to use after um, not using for a long time. So for example, they were abstinent because they were in jail or drug treatment or whatever. Um, and so when you're coming back, if you're using at a higher dose and your body's really prepared for, that can have some, that, that can have some really devastating effects. Um, also using alone, so if there's nobody to keep an eye on you, to keep you awake, to call 911, if there's something that goes wrong, that can be really scary. Um, tolerance. So if your tolerance gets really low, that's an effect. And then also just your physical health. Um, whether you have been eating regularly, drinking water, sleeping, um, what you're, if you have any chronic diseases, there's like a whole bank of literature that I feel like is still being explored around how it relates to menstrual cycle and hormonal cycles, like all these different things that play a role that aren't even just as simple as like, you use this drug and you overdose. It's, so it's very complicated. Um, and therefore, like the strategies we need to use to approach overdose are also very complex. Um, and so, uh, Oh, yeah, I kind of talked about this. So specifically, when we talk about opioid overdose, if we go down to this last point, we can talk about how opioids work. And so opioids specifically, which opioids are things like, um, if you've heard of like lean, that is an opioid. Fentanyl and heroin are both opioids. Um, things like uh, they they like uh, like codeine pills, um, Xanax, things like that. I'm pretty sure, yeah. Like, so there's lots of uh, different uh, opioid medications, and then the most biggest illicit ones would be like heroin and fentanyl. And they, those are central nervous system depressants, which means when you take them, they slow down your central nervous system, which includes your breathing. And so when you take an opioid, it slows down your breathing. And if you have, if that opioid uh, is too strong, it can lead you to reduce your breathing to the point that you're not getting in enough oxygen for your body. And if you're not getting in enough oxygen, then you fall asleep. And if you're continuing to not get enough oxygen, eventually you asphyxiate and you die. And that is why we have naloxone. So in general, um, these are some good universal precaution messaging. I'll probably, I'm gonna send out these slides when I'm done. And I think this is actually a really great education slide for people who are working with directly with youth. These are some multiple tips that you can give people. 
Um, knowing where you're getting stuff from, controlling your own high, not letting other people control how much you're using, um, starting to use less and use slowly, having somebody check on you, testing your drugs, having naloxone know how to use it. All these things are helpful, universal messaging, like even outside of any specific situation, these are things that will tend to keep people safe or um, when they're using. So just like, this is like the, the general advice. And I'm gonna kind of keep pushing just cause I wanna make sure that we have time for questions. Um, but I really re encourage you to kind of come back to this. And this is from our friends at the DOPE Project, um, which used to be where I worked with National Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, and it's a really awesome overdose prevention program based in San Francisco. So what is naloxone? Naloxone is simple, safe, and legal. It is a opioid uh, antagonist, which means in your body. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and like dive through this maybe in a bit of order that I that I have it in. So naloxone is a medication that we use to reverse overdoses. So it's simple. Number one, you use it if somebody is not breathing and not responsive. It is really that simple. If there's some, if you come across somebody not breathing and not responsive, that is a sign that naloxone is something that might help with them. And it's safe because it will not cause harm if someone is not overdosing. I think a question that somebody had submitted on their um, registration form was asking what the youngest you can uh, administer naloxone is. You could uh, give naloxone to a newborn baby. And if that baby does not have any opioids in their system, it will not have any effect on them. Um, because the only thing it functions to do is to knock opioids off of the opioid receptors. Um, so if you, so it's one of those things where it's good first aid, because if you come across somebody who is not breathing and not responsive and you give them naloxone and it was not an overdose, then they will still be okay. And if it was an overdose, then you just saved their life. Um, and it's also legal. So there's several legal, uh, protections based around naloxone in the Bay. So you have AB 635, which is also known as the California Overdose Treatment Liability Act which could protect people who carry, distribute, and use naloxone in the event of an overdose from civil, criminal, and professional liabilities. So that means that if you, in your role as a social worker, um, have naloxone on your person, even if your school um, does not have a naloxone distribution program and you have one on you and a student has an overdose and you use that to reverse an overdose, you are protected from civil, criminal, and professional liabilities for having used that naloxone. Um, and it applies to anybody and everybody, regardless if you go through an official overdose prevention training. So this is like really a great bill that says you have a lot of safety in carrying naloxone and using naloxone to save a life. There really is like not a, they're, they're really trying to clear away barriers from people being able to keep each other safe. Um, and so, yeah, here's some list of opioids. So on this, uh, yeah, on this uh, right side, on the left side, on the white side of the screen, these are um, drugs that are opioids. Um, and they're regulated ones and criminalized ones. And so these are all the drugs that, uh, that naloxone will work on. Um, and then on the orange side are drugs that it will not work on. So it does not work on Coke, it does not work on benzos, which I mistakenly said Xanax. Xanax is a benzo. Um, but, you know, a lot of times when people get fake Xanaxes on the street, they're more likely to be one of these opioids, especially having fentanyl in them. Um, so it does not work on like alcohol, GHB, ketamine, anything like that. It will not reverse those overdoses, but the overdoses it will reverse are on the, this other side of the screen. Um, but also what we know is many overdoses combine like multiple of these, like it's not usually just like one drug. Um, and so if somebody is having an overdose because they're using cocaine and fentanyl and you use naloxone, it will likely uh, at least reverse part of that overdose um, by removing that fentanyl from the equation. And so that person might be able to wake up or gain consciousness and then kind of continue um, maybe having to navigate a cocaine high, but um, they will like they will likely not die from that fentanyl overdose at that point. So yeah, if you come across somebody who is like not breathing and not responsive, giving them naloxone is always a good bet. 
So there's lots of things that people have said about fentanyl. If you have any questions directly about fentanyl, I encourage you to put them into this group chat. But in general, um, there's lots of things that I like to say about this. I think the main one is you cannot overdose from touching fentanyl. This is a document from the American College of Medical Toxicology and the American Academy of Clinical Toxicology from about five years ago, basically saying there is a there is like the risk of like actually having a clinically significant exposure to fentanyl via touching it is incredibly unlikely. You are incredibly not likely to overdose. Um, I think that there are lots of stories of people touching fentanyl um, and experiencing what I would categorize as a panic attack um, and thinking of that as an overdose and responding as such and they get naloxone and they feel better. So they're like, of course I was overdosing and that's not always the case. So you will not overdose from touching fentanyl. Fentanyl does not need to be like a huge bio biohazard. If it's a, like, there's like tons of people making money off of like fentanyl proof hazmat suits and gloves and all that. That's all BS. Don't, don't worry about it. Um, that's like the biggest thing I like to say. What I will say also though, fentanyl is a very uh, strong opioid. And if you ingest it, it, it if depending on the dosage, it could either just have like a, an effect like any other opioid, or if you ingest too much, it can cause an overdose just like any other opioid, but it is a lot stronger. And so the math on that is a lot smaller. So Narcan or Naloxone, so Narcan's the brand name, which is the brand name for the nasal spray. Naloxone is the medication name, like acetaminophen and Tylenol. Um, and it is an opioid antagonist or a blocker. And it can be administered intravenously, intramuscularly, or intranasally. So usually most people who are uh, going to use it in community and will get this Narcan. But you know, when we give it out of syringe access programs, we usually give out the intramuscular version because it is a lot cheaper. Um, and it causes sudden withdrawal. So it does not feel good to be Narcan if you are using opioids regularly. Um, but it's better than dying. And so that, that is usually the, the perspective that we take on it. Um, it doesn't get anybody high. Nobody's allergic to it. If you can use an opioid, then you can use Narcan. Um, and it only works for about 20 to 90 minutes. So this is really an emergency response. Um, depending on how much people ingested, they might still, they, they might uh, still be high after um, the naloxone wears off which means you probably want to keep an eye on them and make sure that they don't re-overdose. Um, but in general, like this will be long enough for the opioid to kind of work through their body. Um, and it has no effect if an opioid is not present in the body. So there's a lot of safety in that. Um, and so this is just like a visual of how it works. So what happens is it binds to your receptors in your body and your brain more tightly than an opioid. So it comes off, it kicks an opioid off of the receptor and it binds to it and it sticks around for a while. And then eventually it might fall off and the opioid might come back on or in that time, the opioid might've metabolized out of your body. Um, if you are like a science teacher or health teacher and you wanna learn more about this and learn how to explain it a bit more in depth, I would love that. I'm a biochemist, I have a biochemistry background. So I love doing the nerdy side of things. So if you want to talk more about this at another time, I would really love to, to have that conversation with you. Um, yeah, uh, Ali had mentioned in the group chat, I love the Dope Project video on administering Narcan. I love the part about welcoming folks back to consciousness because that withdrawal and waking up to chaos is a lot. Yes, absolutely. And I'm about to touch on that just now as well. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. And so, like I said, with withdrawal, it's really painful. Uh, when your opioid tolerance needs are met, you can be in withdrawal or also known as do dope sick. The symptoms of this are really intense. It can be nausea, diarrhea. It can have you feel really sick, uh, physical cravings, a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, and a lot of times the re reasons that you're a drug use, whether that's like pain or trauma or mental health issues are coming back up. And so it's never really as easy as just stop using drugs for people because it's really complicated and people have really complicated relationships to drug use and not using drugs. And so really thinking about how we're supporting people in transitioning their, their drug use um, is, is super, and having a lot of compassion around that is really important. 
All right. So how to reverse an overdose. I'm going to walk through this real quick. Um, number one, assess the situation, use naloxone, call 911, rescue breathing, and then monitoring and support. And I'll walk through these real quick. So number one, you're assessing the situation. You're seeing if a person is overdosing. Um, uh, number, if you see, so a lot of times I encourage people to like kind of trust their instincts on this. For example, if this is happening in a school and a student passes out um, and you're not able to rouse them, it's probably a good idea to give them naloxone. But you know, when I do this training for people who are just kind of like work, walking the streets of like San Francisco or Oakland or whatever, you know when something doesn't feel right in your body. You know when you see somebody who's passed out and they don't look like they put themselves to sleep or they don't look like they they laid down intentionally. So trying to wake people up. So calling out their name, saying like, hey, buddy, trying to shake their knee or shake their arm a little bit, something that'll kind of wake them up. Another idea, if you like kind of put your hand up like this and you use your knuckles, and then I want you to put your knuckles right in the middle of your breastbone and kind of rub it up and down. That, sh that really hurts. <laughs> it really hurts, but also it is a, least, a less dangerous way of waking people up and like uh, grabbing their arm or their head or something like that where they might feel more threatened. Um, and it's really unfamiliar. So if it's going to wake somebody up, doing that sternal rub will do it. Also, we talk about like the mom pinch. So like, just like pinching the back of your arm, like my mom used to do to me in church when I would talk too much. Um, those are things that will usually, if somebody has any consciousness in their body, will usually first wake them up. And so trying to do those things, because you want to avoid using naloxone as you can. Like I said, overdose is a bit of a spectrum. It's like walking into a pool of water that has like kind of a bit of a slope. You know, if you first start going in, it's just your knees before you know it, it's in over your head. And anything you can do to pull people back into the shallows is preferable to them just like air dropping them up out of the pool. And then using naloxone. So um, if you want, after the, you try to arouse them, if they don't wake up, you can either use naloxone um, and then dial 911 or the other way around, just as long as you do it quickly. Um, if you use naloxone and you don't see any reaction after two or three minutes, give them a second dose. All the boxes come with at least two doses. So you will have two doses with you. Um, I do encourage you to start a timer um, because your time moves very weird in emergencies. And so give yourself a timer to see if it'll wake you up um, and to see if they'll wake up and then wait a few minutes. And then you'll call 911 and hopefully in that time, there will be a paramedic there who will then be able to take over. So um, administering the naloxone is first aid, but those people still need medical care. And also you don't even know if it's an overdose at this point. You just know that this person has passed out. And so calling 911 is really essential. Um, I probably have to convince y'all of this a little bit less than you know some other folks who have a lot more fears around calling paramedics and calling 911, but it is, it is a really important step. And then when the person, uh, if the person wakes up before EMS arrives, let them know you called 911 just so they're kind of prepared for that. Um, and if EMS arrives first, or tell EMS what you, that you've already uh, given the person naloxone and letting them kind of know where they're at. Um, and then we have rescue breathing. So if somebody is, if you're, while you're giving naloxone, the other thing you're going to want to do is do rescue breathing. So when someone's experiencing overdose, opioid overdose, what they're really missing is oxygen. That is what they really need is air. Um, because that is uh, what, what they're being limited with. Their diaphragm is, isn't getting the muscle to withdraw their lungs down, to pull air in. That muscle is being depressed by the opioid. And so you need to breathe for them. And so this is something you might have done like as kind of an advanced CPR class at some point is rescue breaths. But essentially what you do is you lay people on their back. Um, you're gonna make, check their airway. So you can just kind of put a finger in and make sure there's nothing blocking it. Cause you're also gonna make sure they're not like choking on something. Um, and then it's really simple. You just tilt their head up, you pinch their nose. So air can't come out there. You seal your mouth over theirs and you just do a simple breath and you just check to make sure that their chest is rising. One breath, um, just every few, every five or so seconds. Um, you do not need to do chest compressions. Um, don't worry about chest compressions. Worry about getting people air um, if they're, if they are, if you think that they're experiencing an opioid overdose. Um, 
if their heart is not beating, that is probably a sign to do more chest compressions. But if their heart's beating and they're just not breathing, um, then air is what they need. Um, and if you're like uncomfortable with this, I know COVID and lots of things have shifted the way people feel about mouth to mouth. Um, you can use a shirt as a barrier. Some people have like CPR masks that they carry around, especially in like AED kits or stuff like that. Um, I've seen people punch the hole out of a bottomless styrofoam cup and use it as a tube. There's lots of things that people have done, um, but the most primary thing is these breaths. Um, and also what I will say is that same bill that AB 635, I think the number was, that uh, protects you from civil liabilities. It also protects you from if you choose to respond to a piece of this and not something else. So if you call 911, but you don't uh, give rescue breaths or you do rescue breaths and you call 911, but you don't have naloxone, all of you're protected in what pieces you respond to. Um, and just using your best judgment and trying to keep people safe is really the priority. And then, um, yeah, and then monitoring and support. So stay with the person. Naloxone wears off in like 30 to 90 minutes. You wanna make sure that that person is okay. Um, and when they wake up, you wanna to explain to them what's going on because they're probably gonna be pretty confused. Um, and then you wanna be an advocate. So if EMS arrives, you wanna make sure that they have somebody in their corner um, especially like from their school, if it's a youth from their community, just somebody who's like, they're all right, let them stand up, let them get some air, managing the situation. If you just have chaos around you, telling people to back up, give the person some space, just really kind of keeping the situation managed is really what that person needs in that moment so they can have a chance to get their bearings. So yeah, so really offering that monitor and support. Um, and then, yeah, Ali in the group chat said, tip a client taught me, they tape a mouth guard to their Narcan. Um, and yeah, our SSP hands them out to clients. Now, which SSP are you at, Ali? Um, so yeah, absolutely. Oh, cool, Santa Cruz, I really love them. Um, all right, all right, cool. Um, and then, uh, Karen, did you want to take this part around getting naloxone and, and giving it away? Did you want me to do this real quick? Why don't you go ahead? I'll, I have a couple other things towards the end of my slides, but why don't you go for it? Okay, for sure. So just real quick, you can get naloxone through your insurance, but don't pay for it. There's a lot of, oop, there's a lot of free options. So for example, through the naloxone distribution project, um, which I can make sure I drop in the chat once Karen switches over to presenting. This is a free program that you can get naloxone through. So this means that you can place an order with them. You need All you need is a standing order, which you can literally get from the state health department. You don't even need a pharmacist or a doctor, but if you have one on site, they can write it for you. And you can just literally order free kits. And with those kits, you can either keep them at your school, you can distribute them to teachers and staff, um, we, me and Karen have been having some conversations around the legalities of distributing it to students. From the way I read the law, uh, there is a lot of plausible deniability in distributing to students that does not always work for schools. So um, there's lots of complicated ways that youth are not necessarily written into the law, but they're also not written out of it. Um, and so that can be a conversation that I'm happy to have offline, or if that's a conversation you want to have in conjunction with your, with your administrative team, I'm super into that. Um, yeah, and then uh, there's you can uh, also get it through partnerships with organizations. So um, you can send clients there. Um, so if you have client, if you have other organizations that um, do distribute naloxone and have maybe less barriers around working with youth, you can inform youth that they can get naloxone there, and you can use your naloxone you might get from the naloxone distribution project, which is a state-run funded program. Um, you can just leave that at your school or give that to adults or teachers um, to, to manage. Um, but yeah, but the naloxone you get from the NDP, you can keep it, you can give it away, you can give it to anyone. Like there's lots of freedom in, in how you use that naloxone because the primary goal is getting it to people who need it. Um, and yeah, and so no, like this, uh, this is exactly what I was just kind of saying. So it protects you from those Liabilities for carrying, distributing, and using naloxone can respond to all, some or no parts of the protocol. It applies to everybody. Um, and there are no regulations specific to minors within AB 635. 
And so they, in this, for the purpose of this law, at least they are treated as like a general population member. Um, and you, as anybody who does policy work knows, there are always lots of policies that seem to conflict with, to conflict with each other. And so a lot of it is just kind of parsing through what is the most relevant to your, your organization and team. All right, and if you wanted to learn any more about California Bridge, please reach out. I'll also drop my email in the chat. I've kind of started to become one of our de facto like youth work people and I do really love doing it. And so please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions around harm reduction, naloxone or substance use treatment and working with youth. Um, I'd be happy to either work with you with it or connect you to a person who knows more than me. Um, and yeah, cool. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Karen. Thanks, Charles. Um, and thanks, Sierra. Um, before I pull up my slides, I was just thinking this morning about this presentation, and I knew that Charles was going to tell you everything you need to know about how to use naloxone. And I'm going to talk a little bit about school-based health centers and naloxone. And when I was first thinking about it, I thought, oh, I'll just describe like how we got it, how we store it, how we trained our staff, so that you know if you had an emergency on a campus, you'd be good to go. And then as I thought about it a little more, I thought, you know what, what really was coming to mind were two stories that I'd like to briefly share with you. And they kind of illustrate some of the ripple effects that I didn't anticipate when we first brought Narcan into our, um, into our clinics. Um, so the first story um, is Jay, who is a school-based health center um, staff member who attended our first all staff naloxone training um, that we had an outside agency do. Um, they did a great training, and at the end, they gave everybody a kit, um, looks like this, that had a couple doses of Narcan inside and lots of information, and she popped it, here we go, she popped it into her purse, and she just kind of left it there, um, which was the recommendation, like just, you know, we have some for our clinics now, but all the staff can also have some in case they ever need it. Um, and about six months later, she came in one day and said that she'd come across somebody overdosing on the street. She administered the Narcan, called 911. Um, the person woke up, gave her a kiss. Um, that was unexpected because often people are really angry, but gave her a kiss and she saved this person's life. So just like something I hadn't really been, been thinking of. And then the second story um, is C, who um, I met two years ago. She's a 14 year old and she just came in for a routine well child check during that visit. I did the psychosocial screen. For those of you that do this, it's called heads or shades. And we ask lots of questions, um, including some questions about whether the young person has questions, interest, using past use, current use about alcohol, drugs, and tobacco. Um, she said no. She never used anything. She wasn't interested. But then I asked my follow-up question, which was, does anybody in your family or in your community or life um, have any problems with drugs or alcohol? Just very wide open question. And she disclosed that yes, somebody in her family was using opioids. Um, so I prescribed, and at this point, this was a few years ago, so I checked with her insurance and they would cover it. So I prescribed Narcan, sent it to the local pharmacy because um, we didn't quite have it in our clinic yet to dispense. Um, I actually called the pharmacist to just make sure that they would give it to her they were confused about why a 14 year old would need it and asked if she had a drug problem, to which I said, it's none of your business, but she needs this medication. And they, they sort of probed a little bit more and I said, no, this is because she needs it and has uh, a contact that, that may need to um, be Narcan. And they gave it to her um, and put lots of refills on there. So that was two years ago. And about a year ago, I saw her again and she let me know that she had used that original prescription. Um, she had got a refill and then she had gotten in touch with one of the um, naloxone distribution projects in the area and had continued to get more naloxone, had given it to all of her friends and family, and they had reversed multiple overdose, overdose episodes um, in that time since I saw her. So that kind of surprised me. Um, and it really made me think like, okay, in our school-based health centers, we have AEDs and EpiPens. And in my, I don't want to jinx myself, but in my 12 years working at Oxenica, I've actually never used either one of those, but here in just a couple years, our staff and our patients had used their naloxone to save multiple people's lives. So it really got me thinking as I got ready to um, do this presentation. So let me just go ahead and share my screen a um, little bit. So, so this is me. Um, and um, I, uh, 
work for La Clinica de la Raza, which is a large community health center in a couple different counties. Um, I'm the associate medical director, and I um, have been there for about 12 years. Um, La Clinica has eight different school-based health centers, and we provide a variety of different kinds of uh, care. Our patients are age three to 25, and we do about 20,000 visits each year. So we see lots of people, lots of opportunities. And over on the, the other side is a little map of where we are. So I wanna talk about sort of the nuts and bolts of naloxone and school-based health centers. And as I talk about this, I will also give some considerations for um, schools that don't have a school-based health center. And please feel free to um, add questions in the chat. I think Sierra is gonna kind of monitor the chat because I'm not as good as, as Charles at talking and reading the chat at the same time. So she's gonna just sort of interrupt if there are questions in the chat. So first of all, why should we have naloxone in school-based health centers? You already saw the numbers and the reasons in Charles' presentation. So I'm not even gonna repeat this information, but we know we have an opioid epidemic. Um, we also know that young people are using opioids, or at least trying them, and sometimes just trying can result in an overdose, even though that might be their very first time, or maybe it's their 10th, their 20th, or 100th time. Um, but sort of on the bigger picture, we really wanted to be part of the solution. We thought it would be kind of amazing to have the opportunity to save a life. Um, and we also thought about how awful it would be if there was an overdose on one of our campuses and we weren't there to respond to it. Um, and we weren't able to save a life because we didn't have this one little medication. Um, we also decided that it was really important to have naloxone be a component of our emergency preparedness. So I mentioned that we, you know, we have AEDs and EpiPens and oxygen and all kinds of things in our emergency kits. And so we needed to have naloxone as well. And then moving sort of down our, our reasons, um, through the process, we discovered that it was an amazing opportunity to train our staff, patients, and families to prevent opioid overdose deaths. And then moving even further, um, it's hard to talk about drugs. Um, it can seem very shaming. It can seem very um, not safe um, for a lot of communities. And this is just one opportunity to normalize talking about drugs. So rather than do you use drugs, how much drugs are you using, how are we going to get you to stop, this turned the conversation into how can we help ourselves, our friends, our families, and our communities when there are overdoses to save people's lives? So a real switch to a more strength-based approach to talking about drugs. So um, we already talked about the Good Samaritan law, that overdose treatment law, AB 635, um, but I wanna draw your attention to the middle sentence here. The California legislation supports naloxone in schools through a specific part of the education code, which is 49413.3. Um, I pulled it up this morning just to kind of look at it again and realize that education code 49414 without the point three is the Cal education code that um, says that schools should provide EpiPens in schools. And really the main differences between the EpiPen legislation and the naloxone um, legislation is that for EpiPen, the rule says schools shall supply and that nurses and other trained people who can really be anyone that gets trained in the school may use EpiPen, whereas the rules for naloxone say that naloxone may be provided and then it's the same nurses and other trained people may use it. So the the state of California is a little bit stronger on EpiPens. All schools should have EpiPens, whereas schools may have naloxone. But otherwise, most of the verbiage is very, very similar. I think they basically copied one law to another. And you can look up that law if you want to kind of get into the weeds of it. But, um, but very, very similar. So if your school has a process for getting an EpiPen or your school-based health center has a process for getting an EpiPen, then it shouldn't be too difficult to get naloxone. Um, and then the question is always, which staff to train? Um, our approach was train everyone. Here's a picture of our end of the year picnic. All of these people were trained um, and I recommend training um, anyone who comes on new, maybe doing a training once a year, um, but really just including everyone. Um, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I don't have clinic every day, so I might not be on site, but our front desk person is there five days a week. And so if someone is having an overdose on campus, I really want them to be able to respond if I'm not there. 
Um, and then how to train staff. Um, I think that Charles gave some, some great information. There are lots of organizations out there that can train staff. And there's also really quick videos. I'm not going to show this video, but you can go online and look up a video. You can give written instructions. My feeling is that basically, if you can train someone to use any medication, if you can show someone how to use a nasal spray for allergies, you can show them how to use um, Narcan to reverse an overdose. And then the rescue breathing and calling 911 and the legal pieces are, are sort of a plus. But if you can at least show people, here's a nasal spray, you press on this button, you've given your dose, you've, you've done like 90% of the training. So I really want to emphasize that um, while when we first rolled out naloxone in our schools, we did a very sort of comprehensive training, talked a lot about opioids, we talked about harm reduction, about our feelings about all of this. As we moved on, we've decided that the most important thing is for people to be trained. And all that other stuff is great, but we want people to at least get the five minute training so that if there's an emergency today or tomorrow and they're the only ones uh, ready to respond, that they are ready and that they can respond. Um, and then how to talk to patients. So um, I wanna leave more time for questions. So I'll sort of go through this quickly, um, but we um, have always talked to patients about drugs and other substances. And a couple of specific places, if you're in a school-based health center, that you might consider adding or beefing up your um, conversation about, about drugs, which hopefully will lead you to a conversation about naloxone, is to take opportunities where you already have them. So when you're reviewing the patient medical history, don't just ask about diabetes and cancer. Remember to ask about family history of substance use. I don't even say abuse. I just I start with use. And what, what are people in your family using? Do you think anyone has a problem with drugs or alcohol, or are they using too much? And sometimes this goes off in you know, lots of different directions, but it's an opportunity. Um, when, when we do a medication review, if the person has been prescribed opioids, maybe they had surgery and they were prescribed opioids a couple of years ago, we might want to ask a little bit more whether they continue to use them or anything else and whether they um, are using something by prescription or whether they're getting something off the street. I already mentioned family history. Um, we do anticipatory guidance all the time. And so that's a great moment to talk about um, naloxone. The craft is a substance use screening. So when we um, administer that survey, we can dive into um, any positive answers and, and use that as an opportunity. Shades and heads are the psychosocial assessments that I talked about where we're just gathering information about the person. Um, and then it, I think it's best practice to immediately offer a prescription or dispense um, naloxone to a patient if they, their friends, family, or just people in their community may be using opioids. Um, we share community distribution sites with our patients so that if they don't want the naloxone that I want to hand them or a prescription, or if we don't have it, if there's some reason that we're not able to get it into their hands, we can tell them where to get it. Um, it's great to show them how to use it. Um, putting posters and flyers around are also really helpful for young people who might not want to share or disclose information with us, but just starting to really get that message out. So I think we have a lot of opportunities to talk to our patients. In most school-based health centers, um, there's a lot of, there's a sort of a strict wall between the school-based health center and the school, at least in our model, where we operate um, as a satellite site of a larger community health center. We operate under HIPAA. We cannot share information with the school about confidential information. So we want to really uh, make sure that that young people know that if your system is different and there is some um, ability for the school to find out information for example if maybe your health services are um, more run through your school nurse or just through a different arrangement you just want to be really clear with young people where the bounds of confidentiality confidentiality may end um, and then how to get naloxone um, we talked about this already or charles talked about that um, I want to just draw your attention to the bottom blue circle in the middle. Naloxone for Schools program um, is an organization that the California School-Based Health Association advertised, I think, last year. Um, so I wanted to see if that would really work. We already had naloxone, but I was like, hmm, you know, can you really get naloxone from them for free? So I filled out their one pager, which just required um, a medical provider license number. It did not require an MD, by the way. So I'm a nurse practitioner. I filled it out put my license and the names of the different schools where um, I wanted to, to um, obtain naloxone. Um, and they sent out a, a supply for our eight different sites. Um, so if you just even Google um, school, uh, I think it's Narcan school program, um, there's an organization that you can um, download a, a one-pager form and, um, and get some naloxone that way. So, um, so that's great. 
Um, and then the other um, thing to add to what Charles said about how to get naloxone is that if you are a school-based health center, you may um, be able to purchase through the 340B program, which is a program for community health centers to purchase medications um, at very low prices. So that's something I'm happy to talk to people about if they um, have questions about that. Um, and then where to store naloxone. So you can store it in your backpack or your purse in one of these like great things or just pop it in there. Um, you can put it in your first aid kit. Um, here's a picture in the middle of our first aid kit with all the other things. So we've got a, an inhaler for someone having an asthma attack. We've got glucose tablets for a diabetic whose sugar might go down too low, EpiPens, Band-Aids, all that stuff just pops on in there. Um, and now that I've run through, hopefully I left enough time for questions. Um, just wanna open it up and see if people have questions or thoughts. So we are right on time. It is noon on the dot. Um, that's okay. Uh, we did have one question come in. So for folks, I understand if you have to hop off, that's really fine. Maybe we'll stay for like five minutes just to answer questions. Uh, we had one question come in. Um, I have heard that fentanyl test strips are hard to get in Santa Clara County. Can you let us know how to find these to distribute to our high schoolers? Charles, I don't know if that would be... Yes, I can respond to that. I am about to drop a link into the chat right now. Um, so basically, there's not really any specific uh, location restrictions um, on how you receive it. It just is in terms of like who is ordering it. So if you, you wanted to order for some from yourself, you could just literally order them from this website. I think on this website, they uh, do them in ba batches of 100 a box. And then if you wanted fewer of them, um, you could order them from uh, Dance Safe, uh, which I'm also going to drop this link in the chat in packs of 10. But yeah, it just is a matter of like paying for them. And if you're having trouble con connecting with somebody to pay for them, if you're having trouble getting funding, reach out to me and I can try and connect you with somebody to get you at least like a starter kit for free. And I'll put in my email in the chat one more time. But yeah, there, there shouldn't be any specific challenges with getting them. They're not definitely not like policy or legal. And I'm gonna post in the um, chat a link. This is to the naloxone um, school distribution distribution program that Karen was talking about. So there's a flyer there that links with more information. Um, and that, um, that if you are in a school and you don't have a school-based health center, that's a great resource for sort of a starter set of naloxone. Specifically, if you just wanna have it for your kind of emergency kit at school, it may not be, they're not gonna give you enough to distribute it to other people, um, but to add it to your arsenal of emergency medications is a super easy way to get it. And it's free. We had another question come in. Can you explain again the limitations around distributing to students? I don't know if you want to take that, Karen. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I would say from a school-based health center perspective, I don't feel like I have any limitations. I feel very able to write a prescription or hand it to a young person. I am protected by my organization so it's almost like if you went to La Clinica, not in a school, you could get that. And now La Clinica is in a school. So we operate very independently of the school with permission from the school and the school knows what's going on. We're not doing anything secretly. Um, I think that if you are a, um, like a school wellness center that's set up differently, or if you're a school nurse, the rules may be different. And I, I have to admit that I just don't know 100% what they are, but generally um, you need to talk to your school first. Um, I think some of the complications may be more political than legal. Um, yes. So it, <laughs> or I would say they are more political than legal. <laughs> and yeah, and political also in like the policy sense of like your, your school might have a policy that's very specific around giving medications to minors. But that's not like actually a state law. That would be something that's more like a local or district policy. 
Um, and it's really dependent, but like, like I said, that SB, that, uh, AB 635, it gives you a lot of protection. Um, and you know, very, it's very similar actually, you know, uh, doing this work out of the emergency department because, uh, there's a lot, it's a very similar energy of like, it's not as much are things legal or illegal. It's a matter of like, okay, there's nothing really written about what you can and can't do. So it's a matter of like your own risk assessment. Um, and I am not in a camp where I tell people that they need to like be putting their necks on the line or their jobs on the line to do this type of work necessarily. And I think it's worth like starting the conversation with your leadership and saying like, this is like a medication that like does not really carry any, it does not carry any risks like to have. All it does is protect people. Um, it's going to be free. You have like the tools to get it whether you want to start by doing a rollout with some specific teachers and then all teachers and then students, like whatever the system and process that makes your leadership and program and parents the most comfortable, I wholeheartedly encourage you to do that type of like ground community work to like help people get accustomed and, and suited to the program, not just like just go immediately all the way to 100 and then people freak out and shut it down. Um, but yeah, like like that very political, very like community based, have those conversations, encourage people to share their thoughts, address their fears. If you get questions that you don't know the answers to, reach out to me and Karen. Um, <laughs> and we can kind of help like uh, assuage some of the fears that often come up when you start talking about um, giving kids medication. But I think more than anything, I have heard so many stories of youth who uh, have received naloxone and used it to reverse their parents' overdoses, their friends' overdoses, like without 911 ever being called, like a situation where kids might have never called 911 because they didn't want to get in trouble. But now they have this knowledge around Good Samaritan laws. They have this knowledge around naloxone and overdose prevention that actually sets everybody up to be safer because we're doing this work. Yeah, and I agree about starting small. If if there's no naloxone on your campus, you might want to just start by going through the process to get it in your emergency kit so that it's right mm -hmm. there next to your EpiPen. And then um, if it's appropriate, maybe invite one of the organizations to do a talk for parents or to do a leadership talk for the school um, student leaders, um, because it's a leadership thing to like save someone's life. Um, just start that way. Maybe have um, your local, if you have a local organization to partner with, um, have a distribution day where they can give out uh, Narcan. Um, and so that's a great way to sort of get things moving, test the waters while you're moving towards a, you know, a, a broader distribution or just kind of um, making things easier for your school community. But all of those steps are great and each one opens up another door to the conversation. And then you get these stories of how somebody saved a life. And so, you know, that the stories really um, are powerful and they can really help with the with the politics. Awesome. Well, we've already gone eight minutes over. So I want to just take a moment to thank Charles and Karen. Um, once again, we will be sending out the recording and the slides after the webinar probably um, towards the end of this week. When you close out of the webinar today, an automatic evaluation will pop up. It's eight multiple choice questions. It really helps us um, if you fill those out. So please fill that out if you can. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day.